to welcome all of you to this new and exciting series celebrating the interdisciplinary nature of the arts and humanities. Um, and I, I will begin just by saying a few words about the Cultural Institute of which I am the director. This was set up in 2016, towards the end of that year, um, to contribute to the university's strategic ambitions um, in terms of what we might do with the creative and cultural sphere um, by way of partnership and partnership with the arts and cultural sector as well. Essentially, there are three main aims to benefit our research, our student education, and the nature of the engagement that we have with wider publics. Um, there's been great benefits to our interdisciplinary research in a time of uh, a research landscape that is focused on providing complex um, solutions to even more complex challenges in the wider world. For our students, we've worked with our cultural partners to enhance their life chances by creating a raft of learning and experiential, uh, experiential opportunities to really equip them with knowledge and skills that will hopefully um, help them um, survive and thrive in an ever more complex world. If you think that uh, according to the World Economic Forum of just a year or so ago, it said that something like 80% of jobs that will exist in 2030 have yet to be invented. And I think that gives you a sense of just what some of our graduates will be facing in a very short time. Our third aim around engagement um, takes the reality of our campus being a real hive normally of creative expression in a city and region of Leeds and in wider Yorkshire which is culturally extremely active and we work with a variety of arts organisations with the great sculpture institutions with Opera North with the playhouse with museums and galleries and the like to make a contribution to the cultural life of the city and we'll be pleased to be supporting the Leeds 2023 year of culture that will be taking place in a couple of years time. So let me just tee things up for the uh, talk this afternoon. Engagement with artists is a key aspect of what we seek to do because engagement with artists can enrich and inform the methods and approaches of our researchers. And one way we seek to do this, one programme we have, is the object of the discussion today, which is the Leeds Creative Labs. I'll not say too much, my colleagues will do so very shortly, but this is essentially one of those rare things. It's a Blue Skies programme. Uh, you can take risks, you can come together in a playful way to explore collaborations between creative artists and academic researchers. And so without further ado, I'll move on to introduce to you um, Scott McLaughlin and Lorna Dugan, who will be uh, will be in their hands for the rest of the event. Scott is lecturer in music composition and deputy director of the Centre for Practice Research in the Arts. He's currently an Arts and Humanities Research Council Leadership Fellow, researching composing for contingency and indeterminacy in the clarinet, with the fantastic title of his um, project, The Garden of Forking Paths. Um, Lorna is Lorna Dugan, is Professor of Physics and Director of Research and Innovation in the School of Physics and Astronomy. She leads an Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council Fellowship to explore hierarchical biomechanics, the study of the mechanics and architecture of biological molecules across length scales to enable the development of novel biomaterials and is an EPSRC public engagement champion and someone who's been very active in the Bragg Centre, um, which really was kind of one of the driving spirits and supporters of this particular lab. So, Without further ado, over, I believe Scott is first up to um, introduce you to proceedings. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Scott McLaughlin. Thank you all for coming today. It's uh, great to see a bunch of people in the chat. Hope everyone's having a good day wherever you are around the world. So myself and Lorna are going to talk about the Creative Labs Bragg edition. I'm going to start by just talking briefly about Creative Labs in general, and then we'll get into talking about this particular edition. So what I can say is that 
Oh, and in perfect timing, my daughter has joined me just at this moment, which is uh, absolutely natural for a live thing to happen. I just need to talk for a few minutes and I'll come out and help you, okay? I just need to go to the I wouldn't like to have my wife because I'm really bored. Okay. Awesome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Creative Labs Frag Center edition. What we have with the Creative Labs in general, it's as Frank introduced it, it's been running for several years now. It's funded by Arts Council England. It's also funded by the Cultural Institute in the University of Leeds. And it's worked in also with the DARE project, which is between Opera North and the University of Leeds. In that time, the as Frank said already, it's something where we're trying to bring together academics and people working in the arts and other professions outside because this is something that certainly as academics, we don't get to do enough. I'll come back to that in a little moment. Some numbers across the um, eight or nine years it's been running so far. There's been about 180 participants, that's between academics and non-academics. They've run about 15 different editions, which has in some cases been very broad, just bringing in people across a theme, and in some editions has been highly focused, like the Bragg edition at the moment is looking specifically at the Bragg Centre's work with materials. Each time there's an addition, what happens is it's a very short-term engagement. So a teams apply, artists apply, academics apply, and they're brought together into teams. And then you have a period of a couple of months to do a couple of meetings with no fixed output. So there's no intention of creating something specific at the end of it. It really is an opportunity to work together in a shared physical and intellectual space that encourages playful interaction for innovation, impact, and networking. And this is really the key thing about it. When I've done it myself, I did it back in 2017 on a particular um, edition that was to do with working with the Priestley Climate Center. So this is working with climate scientists and I worked together with some clients, climate scientists and a team of graphic designers from outside the university. And it really was an opportunity to bring together people who had a shared fascination with, in our case, forests. So we ended up having a, a big pile of walks in the forest, looking at what connected the academics' interests, what connected the graphic designers' interests, and my interests in sound, and coming up with a range of possible projects we could do. So just working playfully, not thinking about something that we had to have an output for, but seeing where the possibilities lie and where we could go and look for other funding or build other projects on top of that. So that was, that was my, my introduction to it. And since then, I've obviously been working with this particular Bragg Center edition in a different role, overseeing and watching what happens. So just briefly, to give you, sketch you an overview of what things the Creative Labs are good for, the various different ways that they help out. Because academics, we, it's very easy for academics to end up in a disciplinary bubble where you talk to people working in your area, but you don't always get the opportunity to just sit down and talk to people who share fascinations with you, who are interested in the same kind of things, but don't necessarily think about them in the same way. So the possibility to build relationships across disciplines, both in and out of the university, engaging with other people, playful exploration, the, all of these things can lead to innovative thought, research, et cetera, in a way that doesn't put a particular output shape pressure on you. So that's what I wanted to talk about in general about the idea of creative labs and how they're useful. And, and I have to say, as someone who's taken part in them and watched other people taking part in them, they are absolutely a joy to be able to do. So at this point, I'm going to pass over to Lorna any moment. And Lorna's going to talk about uh, the specifics of the Bragg edition and the Bragg Center. Lorna? Okay, thank you, Scott. And uh, hopefully, uh, I've clicked on to the next screen, and hopefully you can see me now. Can you see me, Scott? <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. Oh, only in the small screen. That's, that's fine. Hello, everyone. It's, it's really wonderful to join you, at least virtually. Um, so I also took part in the Creative Labs and thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity for the Bragg Centre, uh, of which I am a member. So the Bragg Centre for Materials Research, if, if you remember the Leeds University campus, 
Uh, in between the chemistry building and where engineering starts, there was a, a building called the Old School of Mines building. And that is now being transformed into a, a new Bragg building, which will house uh, physics, uh, the school which I am part of, uh, computing, as well as the Bragg Center itself. Um, and you can see this our, uh, architect's impression of what it will look like, and we'll actually be moving in there next year. So um, a, a really exciting time for all of us. And the vision of the centre is to discover, create and design new materials. Uh, so for me, as a Creative Labs participant, I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to engage with artists because they, of course, are fascinated by materials as well. So the, the Bragg Centre has a number of themes um, and you can see them here. Um, but, but in a nutshell, uh, this whole centre is interested in designing, making and creating uh, innovative new materials. So this really seems to be a, a perfect combination for something like the Creative Labs, where we're trying to think outside of the box, go beyond our normal disciplines and, and discover this, this innovation. The centre itself um, has over 170 members. It's, it's very interdisciplinary. Uh, it involves 15 schools across the University of Leeds and is part of a national network called the Royce Institute, where there are a number of other uh, Russell Group universities involved. Um, I, and just to give you a, a brief snapshot, here's two outputs from just the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've been working on materials, biological materials at the nanometer length scale. That's the picture, the blue balls on the left hand side. And we've been designing ways to connect them through specific uh, chemical cross linking to make new biomaterials, things called hydrogels that pr can provide applications in healthcare. And then on the right hand side, you can see um, a, a new paper in advanced functional materials uh, where Sanji and her team are um, creating these um, almost Lego-like self-assembly of gold triangular nanomaterials. And she can start to stack them in any kind of arrangement that she wants. And what's remarkable about, about this is that this is all happening at the nanometer length scale. And you can see she's made a little um, a cartoon on the left-hand side to depict, this is the kind of thing children do uh, with building blocks, right? But we're doing this now on the nanometer length scale. So it's a really exciting time. So, um, you know, we're building this new community of scientists and engineers in the Bragg Centre to explore innovation and materials design. And what we really want to do is engage beyond the Bragg Centre to, to explore new ways of working. So what better way to do that than to challenge ourselves to take part in this creative labs. And that's what we've been doing um, over the last nine months or so. So we were supported by a University of Leeds interdisciplinary pump priming fund, and that allows us to establish this Creative Labs Bragg Centre edition. And one of the aims is to, to, to support our growing community, but also to have wider engagement. And in fact, this is one of the, the goals of the UKRI, our, our funding agency, um, to do better with, with public engagement. So there's some incredible opportunities to do that. Um, so we had an open application process last year. Uh, we had over 140 applications, so that was really um, fantastic. Uh, and the artists uh, met with the Bragg Centre academic partners for the first time back in November. So you can imagine the scene. We were in a room. Um, we were introducing people for the first time. Uh, they were in introducing themselves and their mutual interest. And that's, that's where it all began. And so we've created this, this cohort, if you like, of um, creative labbers for the Bragg Centre. And, and they're going out to, to um, take the first steps in this area. And, and so for a period of 12 weeks initially, um, the collaborative pairs had an opportunity to, to meet and discuss their mutual interests. As Scott said, there was no um, expected output, but of course there have been a huge number of outputs already because of that collective interest. Um, in January, we had um, an amazing showcase event. I really wish you could have been there. Um, and, and maybe I'll come back to that uh, towards the end. Um, but this, this is just some pictures that, that I took at the event. Here you can see um, students, PhD students, postdoctoral researchers, research fellows, professors, artists from a broad range of disciplines engaging together and very excitedly sharing uh, the work that they have done. Um, we're going to give you a little snapshot of, of some of those uh, in, in the next few slides. Um, I'll introduce the first couple. Um, so first of all, we had Stephen Harrell, 
Um, Stephen is um, a, an artist, a filmmaker, a creative director, and he likes to work with materials um, and to, to put them in different perspectives. And he was working with a, a research fellow, Ben Hansen, who's actually in my own group, who works on this hierarchical biomechanics, mechanics at different length scales. And here they were exploring the negative space. And what they mean by that is the space that we don't study as artists or scientists, all the other stuff that's in the background that we sort of ignore. And they were asking the question of how important is that background information and what added value could we have by looking at that? In this next slide, Andrew Lee is a, a, works in bio nanotechnology. He works on something called DNA origami. DNA is a very important biological uh, molecule. And he's working on the self-assembly and arrangement of that molecule at the nanoscale. Cabinet of Curiosities is a, a creative company that work and specialize with paper and with miniaturization. So you can imagine the kinds of uh, uh, conversations that they were having exploring these mutual interests. Dominic Smith is an artist uh, and his particular interest is hybrid digital materials. And he was working with Mike Reese, who is a polymer physicist that works on cellulose and using cellulose to make uh, new materials. And here in this, this one image that I've taken from their collaborative project, they've created a material that uses photosensitive dyes and they've imprinted it onto a cellulose material that Mike has made in the lab. And so they're really starting to put their two um, expertise and techniques together to create these, these innovative materials. And then in the last example that I'm going to talk about, um, Lawrence Malloy is a sculptor and artist, and he was working with the Lima Center. Uh, that stands for Leeds Electron Microscopy, Electron Microsco Microscopy and Spectroscopy Center. It's an internationally recognized center for looking at things on the microscopic, nanoscopic length scale. And here they had a really uh, playful project where they were looking at the samples were in fact spices that you might use in curries. So things like cardamom pods, star anise, and using this technique of transmission electron microscopy to obtain beautifully detailed samples of very, very different samples um, indeed. Um, so those are the examples that I wanted to share. I'll, I'll pass over to Scott now. Thanks, Lorna. So I'm looking at uh, the other three that we've got here. Murray Royceman Ward, who's a, a PhD student and sound artist, was working with the Susan Bernal Lopez group and with one particular researcher in there on concrete. And the Lopez group looks at different ways of making concrete, new ways of thinking about concrete, etc. because clearly concrete is a very important thing in the world at the moment. And what Murray's interested in is the sound of things, the sound of materiality. So Murray and the group did all sorts of strange experiments with putting microphones inside concrete as it sets, shattering concrete with microphones in it, listening to the resonance of concrete in different thicknesses. And that was really interesting to work with the way that they can alter how concrete is made and how uh, the different types of approaches to analyzing that. If we jump on to the next one, Louise Wilson is a sound artist and, and design artist. She, she does a lot of installation work. She's also an academic at the at, uh, University of Leeds. And she was working with the Schroeder Group who specialize in molecular and microstructural materials performance. So they're looking at materials right down on, on the, the molecular and micro, uh, microstructural scale. So again, Louise was, Louise was taking a similar tack to Murray in some ways in that she was trying to work with what these materials can sound like at that scale, but, it, but also working with the expertise of these researchers in how she can find really particular materials that might have interesting sonic properties and particularly then finding ways to analyze and exploit those down at a level that isn't usually thought of uh, in terms of, of sound. So she, she ended up having to do an awful lot of amplification. Sorry, Lorna, go ahead. <laughs> The third one I'm going to talk about is uh, Beth Wilneff and Sarah Roberts. Sarah is an installation artist and you can see one of her works here and Sarah has a real specialism in colour. In fact there's, there's another one that we can't show here but that's an entire room 
which is just pink stuff. And it's quite shocking to see. It's, it's both a normal looking room and also it, everything is extremely pink in all sorts. Of, I didn't realize there was that many pinks. But Beth is someone really interesting because she works across science and art. She works in an art department, but she specializes in X-ray, <coughs> excuse me, X-ray spectroscopy of color pigments. So they're looking again at the detail of color, how light strikes color, how altering pigment can change the way color affects things. So it, that was a real example of a shared fascination. Someone coming from a very scientific understanding of color and pigment to someone with a very intuitive understanding of color and pigment and trying to find ways that they can build on each other's work. So all of these were absolutely fascinating different projects to watch in process and watch the discussions that they're having and seeing the ideas that come out of those that may be built on further. Thank you, Scott. So um, uh, maybe just to, to, to sum up this part of the part of the talk, um, this is really helping us to establish a new community within the Bragg Centre. It's helping us to think um, more broadly about the way we engage people with our research. And actually, it's supporting future grants applications um, and helping us to amplify some of the external profile of our research. I, I've been watching some of the questions as they, as they come in, and I'm so tempted to answer them now, but, but I, I'm going to wait until the end. Um, just, just this is, this is my uh, last slide. This, people taking part in the creative labs are enjoying them hugely. It's making them really question the research that they're doing on both sides and sending them off in different directions, but it's having a wider impact as well. So um, some of the outputs of the creative labs have been part of, um, for example, the upcoming Bradford Science Festival um, in October. They've fed into a, a, a national scheme called the, the National Saturday Club. Um, and uh, uh, one I'm particularly proud of is the Bags of Creativity project, where we're, we're taking part in a, a national initiative where some of the, the creative projects are, are going into activity bags that are reaching over 8,000 children in the Yorkshire and Humber region. Um, so this is a real opportunity to bring current re research to an audience that well, certainly as a scientist, I would never have had, had access to before. Um, so, so this is really um, empowering. So I'm aware of the time. So I'm, I'm going to jump now because we've given you a bit of a snapshot. But, but really to, I think, appreciate the Creative Labs, you've got to hear from people that are taking part in a project right now. So it gives me um, real pleasure to introduce a, a Dr. Caitlin Stoby from uh, the School of English at the University and Dr. Paul Beals from the School of Chemistry. And they they are going to share their journey of being part of a creative lab. So I, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, can you hear me now? All right. I'm just going to uh, briefly say a few words about my collaboration with Paul and then I'll hand over to him and then I'll end um, by reading some of the poems that I've produced so far during our collaboration. So uh, my background is in literary studies and I often write about biological sciences and questions of ethics, but from a very literary point of view. So it's been fascinating looking at the kind of research images and videos that Paul and his group are producing and talking with them because it's often the kind of um, the throwaway comments or the, the um, ways of explaining it to someone who's not a specialist that end up sparking the poems or um, the written content that I've produced. So I'll be thinking about questions like, uh, what is life? What is suffering from a very philosophical perspective? But then to hear about these really, really um, tiny vesicles and artificial cells and, art and membranes, it really pushes me in a different direction and makes me start thinking, oh, how far can I actually take this? Um, but I think also Paul has been challenged by some of the terms from my field. So I'll, I'll pass over to him and uh, 
for that part. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Thanks, Caitlin. So, uh, I mean, the th it was re is really great to get started on talking with Caitlin, who comes from a very kind of different background, has different kind of ideas and philosophies. So, we kind of started by trying to find some common ground in our interests. So, uh, Caitlin has lots of interest in this uh, in the philosophical field of new materialism, and we were trying to look for some of the synergies between that and and material science, the Bragg Center. And uh, what what I found is that. Uh, the, the ideas of new materialism are very scientific in their field and a, and a lot of their terminology and their ideas can be mapped onto real scientific concepts and we were exploring a lot of this language and uh, a lot of these concepts t together uh, from our, our individual perspectives and one word I, I'll have a look at briefly is this word you see here interaction because for me that has a lot of uh, synergies uh, and is very synonymous with the the idea of emergence uh, as a scientific concept Concept, which is where in complex systems, the, 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 the complex system together has properties that the individual components don't have. And a, a classic example of that would be life. So if you take a living cell, the, the living cell has lifelike properties, but if you take the individual biomolecules that make up that cell, that those, those, those living properties are, don't exist in those individual molecules. So, so life is an emergent property of chemical systems. And that kind of comes back to a lot of our research that we're trying to do on, on kind of designing what we call an artificial cell, where we're making novel soft materials, where we're trying to engineer in properties that, uh, that, are, that mimic those that you might find in a living organism or or are inspired by some of the properties uh, of life uh, and when it comes to defining what is life you might be surprised to hear that that's a very ill-defined uh, question you, you think you might know uh, whether a material is living or not living and uh, if, if I put an object in front of you you'd be able to decide which is which but scientists do not have an accepted definition of what is life and that's kind of came into a lot of Caitlin and I's discussion so as we start to make these artificial cell like soft materials as we, as we increase the complexity where's the boundary between the living and the non-living and this led, led to this idea of, of blurred lines between what is living matter and non-living matter which, which has some really kind of interesting philosophical and ethical questions around it so we've had some really interesting kind of conversations around that which I think kind of inspired some of Caitlin's creative outputs and and this has been one of the interesting aspects of our collaboration but there are other benefits as well so having Caitlin around the lab who thinks very creatively in her line of work it, it is really great to, to have her around in the lab and, and meeting with the with the, the PhD students and postdocs who are doing the research because inherently scientific research in itself is, is very creative as well as you're trying to develop new ideas new experiments new materials you have to think fairly creatively too so having someone who naturally thinks creatively Around, around the group helps the students think about their, their, their work and their projects in new ways, which hopefully will in inspire more creativity out of their thinking too. Uh, and the final advantage I think in the kind of the science arts uh, collaboration is, is in how, how we engage the public with scientific ideas uh, a lot of the time public some members of the public will see science as you know a very very rigid precise and very difficult uh, concept that's really not for them whereas if they if they say artistic objects people are comfortable in making their own interpretations so by presenting science in the form of art it allows people to break down those barriers and approach these scientific concepts on their own terms and maybe maybe gain some some new things out of them that they wouldn't do out of traditional uh, public engagement with science so I, th th there's lots of different levels where I, I found this to be advantageous so i think i think at this point it would be a really great time to hand back over to Caitlin and she can she can uh, kind of show you some of her creative outputs from our, our collaboration so far. Great, thanks Paul. I'm just going to read two poems today. Uh, all right, there we go. The, the first one, this one, was written when I was going to the um, cryo-electron microscope with one of Paul's PhD students and it was my first time really being in a lab and in uh, an environment with such a large piece of machinery and so I was thinking about scale and I was thinking how we were looking at these tiny tiny vesicles so um, the, the samples that Rashmi were looking at were, and they were kind of if you can see the tip of my pen they were probably each grid was the size of the tip of my pen and 
on each grid, you've got hundreds of vesicles. So you really, the scale is absolutely mind blowing when you think about it. And um, these samples are frozen, but sometimes the ice can thicken and that can actually um, interfere with the entire process of, of looking at them in the microscope. So I was thinking about all of these issues of scale and size, and um, the, the title of the poem is a quote from um, what Rashmi said to me is that what we're, what we're looking at is frozen in time and space. So I'll just read it. Frozen in time and space, but also just on the grid, this black ice attracted to copper, to thickening, to messing everything up. We're in the control room, down behind the glass is a microscope double a human's height. What we can see, metal, a vat of nitrogen, university branding. What's visible thanks to the screen, what's human made yet mimicking the near atomic parts of me is a membrane within a membrane next to some dozens of the same and that's just the one frame. There are hundreds on each grid. I'm looking at eight lacy grids today. Small wonder then when we catch a vesicle at the rare second of bursting, ruptured membranes to the blobby line of light, or is it my stigmatized eye? You decide. The second poem is a four in one poem, and I'm just going to read the final poem, but uh, some brief background. So this was um, created after speaking with another PhD student who is looking at um, vesicle adhesion to cells. And what he'd done is he, he, well, he sh showed me these images where each part of the cell was colored with a different dye to show up um, when viewed under the microscope. So here we've got the membranes in green, then there were also the vesicles in red, and finally um, the nucleus of the cell was in blue. And I thought, wow, that's kind of like language. We get nouns, we get verbs, we get adjectives, and you string them all together and you've got a sentence, and then you string those together and you've got a story. So I thought, how can we show this, this kind of um, composition of a cell through language? And um, yeah, so I, I wrote three poems that in different colors, they're quite abstract, but when they uh, merge, they form a poem that is telling a story about pain. So, so the research that um, Juan, the PhD student, was um, using this for is to think about developing nano painkillers that would be used after abdominal surgery. So I was thinking about how we articulate pain, how often that's actually not through language, we'll, we'll scream, we won't use words. So there's a kind of contradiction there between what we feel and what we say. Uh, so I'll, I will read the poem, the final poem, which is called Grimace Scale. And it, Grimace Scale is used uh, during animal testing to determine whether or not non-humans are feeling pain. Grimace Scale. Word slash a word, one word, hurts. Artificial nucleus of sentences, language's golden rule. Never use two words when a scream will do. There are people designing tiny pills to soothe abdominal surgery recovery, reducing hospital stays, max three days, first visualizing vesicles attaching to membranes. The biophysicist's next tricks sprayed analgesics with slow release. Is there heavenly grammar in vitro, in animal tested hysterics, or is there perhaps a one in five chance of negativity, a two human body going to hell with high marks, an award of opioids, and yet an inability to articulate the pain, the translation of what's minute, what's on the face, stabbing in technical color. So I'm just going to um, leave it there, I think. And I, I think Lorna might want to say something else about where um the creative labs are headed after this <laughs> um thank you thank you so much caitlin and paul and um for everyone listening i i i'm sorry that we've we've run over a little bit i i think it really reflects the excitement um that we have about this project and, and we have so much more we want to share with you but perhaps in closing maybe just to reflect we're all here virtually joining this um, and if we think about the future and, and what that might mean and the future for the next generation, uh, you're all Leeds alumni, you all chose a particular subject to follow. Uh, but, but wouldn't it be amazing in the future if there could be more connection between those subjects um, at a university and, and all across the education system? 
If we want to be creative in materials research, we need to go beyond the boundaries of STEM. We need new ideas. We need new questions. Uh, and I think something like the Creative Labs provides a wonderful environment to do that. And I hope, uh, I hope we can see it continue in future. I'm going to stop there because I'd, I'd really like to, to look to the questions. So I'll, I'll hand over to Frank. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hello again, everybody. We've um, got a number of questions, which I'm going to um, take, I wouldn't say at random, but there's a, there's a, a first one up um, on my screen is as follows. Just to, just to say we are a little over time, but we'll, there's some great questions here, so we'll, we'll run over a little bit. So uh, one question from an anonymous attendee that says, the projects have produced some interesting and lovely creative works. Uh, they also brought benefits and change to the way the scientists involved work. And I guess I put that one first, Lorna, because it picks up a little bit on what you were just saying at the end there. So a question um, perhaps to Lorna or, and, and the group. Sure, sure. I'm happy to answer that. It absolutely had. So, so one of the joys of this project is that um, people from, from all across the hierarchies, if you like, at the university were able to take part. And so students, I think it changed their perspective uh, in that it, it's good and it's favorable to ask questions about their research and not to accept the norm. So if you think back, those of you um, that, that did projects during your undergraduate and your PhD, you might have been at the start given a project uh, and, and set off in a particular direction. Um, and, 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 and you know, trying to get the idea across that it's okay to challenge that question that you've been given, to perhaps say to your supervisor, is that the right question? Or you know, should we be looking at this other thing? Or why are you ignoring this other thing? And that's a question that came up quite a bit in our engagements with, uh, with some of the artists. Why is the focus this? Why are you not thinking about these other things? So it's certainly changed the way we work in terms of, of not just accepting the norm for our fields or the accepted uh, view of what our field thinks, revisiting some of those preconceptions. Okay, thank you. So um, we had a, another question really, which I guess was just ask, inquiring as to how the people with the quote shared fascinations actually came together. If you could say maybe Scott about the the matching process that um, how you all found your way together? Well, I think one general point to make is, is that this is a continuous problem, probably worldwide, but certainly within higher education, when we're in such siloed specific fields, that bringing people together who care about specific things is, is not easy. And universities do do good work in trying to create networking type events to bring these together but one day or even one hour or one lunchtime sitting in a room with some people is never really enough you need that time to go and talk you need that time to see how people work so that's why creative labs is good it gives you just enough time to really get in sync with that shared fascination but to go back to the specifics of that question the open call goes out and gives a sense of what the themes are what the larger working ideas are to delimit the process a little bit and as Lorna said we had what was it 100 and, 100 and something 140 applicants uh, so we had a lot of people coming in and then the process of trying to get those together is really a matchmaking and hoping one you see people who seem to do things that are interesting you look at their work but really trying to match up someone where you're seeing a science and academic based profile uh, to match them to someone who has an artistic profile the two don't always quite talk to each other so you've got to make some educated guesswork so it's good to have the creative institute team there who are used to this and we worked as well with someone from opera north who's very used to doing this kind of thing so that that helped thank you uh, there's there's one question that i can perhaps take very quickly which is is there likely to be another call out for collaborators um, the, the reason for it went out yesterday, um, we're pleased to be able to be undertaking our first entirely digital or remotely operated um, creative lab, and that will operate on similar principles, um, bringing the artists together with the academics from different disciplines. Um, there's a question from Joanne Baker. Um, do you see any opportunity for collaboration with communities mm. and what form that might 
take. And there was there was another question around um, working um, collaborative projects in educational or learning contexts. So maybe if I could, I'm just keen to bring in the other the other speakers. The question about have you applied your collaborative projects in educational or learning contexts? Maybe a question for Caitlin and Paul, if you've anything to contribute on that one. Paul, would you like to speak or shall I? <laughs> I'll let you go, Caitlin. Okay, well, um, coronavirus has somewhat messed with our original plans. So there have been certain engagement events that were going to take place in Leeds, which obviously now are not. But um, I think actually, if anything, we're quite lucky because as Lorna was saying, um, a lot of the Bragg's um, outputs were very material based, but ours is very wordy. So it means it's easier to go online and it's easier for us to um, apply for kind of reading. So I've got a reading coming up um, that's part of a poetry reading that's um, kind of related to public health and thinking about public health and private illness. So I'll be reading some of what I produce for this there. So that's definitely a way of um, continuing with public engagement during the current crisis. But I, I think if you'd asked us, us if you'd asked us that a few months ago, we would have had a different answer for you. Um, mm -hmm. We've been limited somewhat at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Jim Greenwood, and maybe put this one to to you, Paul, and this is something that kind of relates to the big idea behind the Creative Labs is that it's, it's risk taking, it's, it's blue skies. Um, there's no expectation really other than there's possibly something that might be triggered and catalyzed that is, is positive. So the question is so many times it seems that research projects have to be, have to have a defined output. We know quite well about that, I think, in our daily lives. Did the researchers find it liberating or worrying not to know the output at the start of the project. So maybe Paul, if you'd like to kick off, but the other colleagues, please feel free to chip in. Um, so no, I, I don't think my group found it worrying at all. I thought they, they found it very different. And in fact, it was, it was very useful with, as part of this creative labs pro process, not to have any expectations of an output. It gave uh, Caitlin and I a lot more freedom in just having some open conversations and discussions and just seeing where they, where they led. And, and, and it could have been that they led nowhere and there was no pressure for it, for it to, to, to do so. Um, so it really ensured Sure that whatever we did do was something that was of, of mutual interest and things that we, 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 were, we were excited about and wanted to pursue. Um, and, and, for, and for my research group who engaged, engaged very actively with Caitlin, they all presented their projects to Caitlin in, in a big group meeting. Caitlin uh, shadowed many of them uh, doing, uh, doing experiments. It was a very kind of new and interesting way for them to think about their projects rather than engaging with people with a very kind of scientific background that think in the same way as them they had to pull themselves out of that comfort zone and try and try and explain their project in a slightly different way to someone who doesn't have a scientific background and also getting questions and and, and thoughts back that they may not have normally expected not the types of responses you will get from scientists and this kind of broadens your your thinking around the project so i think many of them have found it very exciting and they all look forward to seeing caitlin's new outputs when they come through and uh, so so it's uh, for, for them it's been a very kind of new and different experience which I think has been very positive. Okay thank you. Um, I've just used the term blue skies research and there's a question come in as to how one might define it and I'm going to pass the buck on that one. Lorna do you want to pick that one up? Does that yeah. speak to your final point about how, how different approaches and methods can yeah. be enriched and informed by interacting with other disciplines? Yeah, so, so the impact of our research is, is something we have to think about very carefully. Um, and perhaps to put this in context, we, we get funding for our research, we apply to our specific research council. And part of that application is to talk about the impact, the immediate impact of the research, the impact in five years, the impact in 10 years. And for some fields, that's, that's I would say, easy or, or more straightforward, um, particularly if it's, if it's related to, to treatment um, in, in healthcare. For other fields, it's much more difficult. And as a physicist, there, there are particular areas in physics which, where it's really hard because 
it's fundamental research. It's, it's research to have a new understanding that won't necessarily benefit anyone in the next decade or 20 years, but in the future it could because any new understanding is helping us advance um, um, as, as, uh, as mankind. Um, so, so Blue Sky's research is, is really very explorative. Um, it's, it's taking new approaches. It's not necessarily having or, or really not having a hypothesis or a predetermined notion of what the outcome will be, but it's putting together a, a work package or an approach to try to explore a particular area. And so you can see that creativity actually has a huge role to play in that. And some of the biggest advances that we see in science are when people come together from different fields, they perhaps bring a new technology together with another technology or approach to take a massive step forward. Um, so, so something like this environment where people, as Paul says, people can come along and not ask the same questions because they've been trained in the same way, but they can come in asking new questions. They can really put you on a back foot with some of these questions and make you sort of rethink, your, uh, rethink the way you've approached something. And in particular, uh, rethink what you've accepted in your field as being true uh, and perhaps make you take a few steps back and revisit that. Thank you. That's a, that's a really, really interesting response. And I guess it, it picks up a little bit um, on, on Lorena's, um, Lorena Serrano's question about, I suppose this is looking at it from the point of view of the, 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 the creative practitioners, but it's about communication with people that come from different backgrounds. So maybe, maybe for Caitlin, um, mm. how you share your own very creative project, you're a poet, um, when dealing with material scientists. I think I maybe struggle more with understanding them, to be completely honest. <laughs> it's a very difficult um, terminology, but I'm, I find that it is just engaging with the process. So it was um, where, where I really got to understand and where I think they started to understand what I was interested in was when we were in the lab together and discussing shared terms. So that slide I showed where there was interaction, agency, other terms like this. I think uh, one of the first things that Paul and I did was sat down together and said, okay, what do you think of agency? And what's your understanding of this? And just to, to kind of uh, treat it almost like a dictionary exercise where we, we were coming with our own understandings and thinking, okay, what, what are we going to take from that definition of agency? And what are we going to take from that? Um, talking about creative practice though, I guess that also would be documenting each stage of it. So a lot of it is playful. A lot of it is just, seeing oh does this work maybe maybe i should scrap that poem or you know that that isn't going to work out and i've actually we we titled this collaboration blurred lines life matter poetry but now i've started writing fiction um about some of paul's paul's group's research so i think that you have to be open to adapting your own creative practice as well okay thank you um i i'm i'm just getting a message to try and draw things to a close by 25 past. I've still got two outstanding questions. One is that the ultimate goal of the lab, maybe if I, I take that following on from Lorna, it's, it's really to, to bring people together with different ways of approaching um, matters of, of interest, different methodologies, a different vocabulary, to see if the interactions that are triggered can yield some new perspectives, um, new ways of doing things. And ultimately, I guess at the back of it, there's the, the understanding that some of the issues facing our world are so very complex that there's no one discipline, academic discipline, that can provide the particular solution to it. And that um, perhaps there's a better chance of providing solutions if you view things through the lens of different disciplines. We've got a question. I don't know whether we can do this one, but I want to give everybody a shot about uh, colours and materials influencing cognition and communication skills. Is there a short answer to that one from anybody? I, I think that's an amazing question. And, and actually the, que yeah. the, the question before it, I'm, I'm very interested in as well. Um, and and um, Riza, I, I hope this, this is addressing your question. I, I'm personally really interested in education and what attracts people to STEM subjects and what attracts people to the arts. And if there's more that we can do to, to bring those two tribes, if you like, together for longer. Because what, what worries me actually is that by a very early age, children associate with one or the other. 
and you know shouldn't we do better shouldn't we bring young people along for a much a much longer period in the education system mm. so that they see much more of the arts and they see much more of the stem subjects before they make those life choices so i was really interested in in the introductions that a number of you said you did uh, you graduated in a science and, and you're now in the arts and you know that's wonderful to see and and you know i'd love to know more about that story actually and um, so i think something like the creative labs could give us some tools to allow us to engage with more mm -hmm. people so that we can bring those two worlds together and keep them together for longer because as frank says we're, we're only going to find these solutions by bringing more disciplines together rather than separate people so young in the education system thank you lona that's that's uh super that's a really super response and i just echo the, the thoughts and the sentiments very uh, very loudly um so um i will draw things to a close now with some thanks first of all thanks to all of you from various um parts of the world i've, I've taken a photo that i'm going to post on twitter that shows indonesia china canada and other countries but also lots of people more local to Leeds. It's um, something that's always been a pleasure in my professional career at Leeds to engage with the alumni community. Thanks for your fantastic questions and obviously the, the attention that's gone into those. Um, and I would like to draw your attention so that this is the first of a series of four or so and that the next one is on Thursday the 13th of August, same time, same place as they say and it will be looking at something called return which is an interactive installation that creates a sense of shared space and emotive connection between virtual users and it's work of the artist Akila Bertram and that's going to be really really fascinating not least because it focuses on how cultural connections in the African diaspora can be fostered across a range of locations and probably an idea that with um, social distancing and confinement has very much had its time. So thank you from Leeds, from the, um, the view out of my former office of the Cloth Workers Hall and we hope, I'm sure all of us, um, to be reunited on that campus at some point in the hopefully not too distant future. And in the meantime, do all keep well and safe and very best wishes to you all. Thank you.